Welcome. Hello, everyone. Well, we've got a great story to tell the people <laughs> today. Yes, we do. We have uh, a wonderful guest with us. You stay tuned. We're going to talk about her life before we even get started. And what a life. Oh, my goodness. What a background. And what she's doing today is incredible. It is. And uh, we've got Darlene uh, going to be on the program today. And she's going to be interviewing Sherry Ann. And uh, what a blessing this girl is. Yes. We're going to start the program with Sherry Ann. Oh. Well, you've been waiting to hear who our guest is, yes, right, honey? Yes, yes. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Tina Levine. Yay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now, Tina, oh my goodness, you're a Christian comedian, a former radio and talk show host. You're an inspirational speaker. And 
And why did you write? You have created and Tina she's Talks the Truth. What? A child of God. Yes, a child and of she God. is a child and of foremost. God. That's right. Tina Talks the Truth. Where'd that come from? Well, Tina Talks Truth, I believe that there's hope. Bottom line, that's it. You know, I believe that there's hope for everyone. And even when people feel like they're in their darkest place, or maybe there's a circumstance that happened that they're thinking, this is it. I'm helpless. I'm hopeless. And I just want to encourage them that there is hope no matter what your circumstances are. If it's addictions, if you're struggling with past abuse or present abuse or any kind of adversity, that there is hope because of him. Yes. I mean. Now, you've been through it all. And got the t-shirt. <laughs> I think you've been through it all. If not, I can't imagine what else is in your life. But tell us a little about your growing up. So when I was growing up, actually, my father was an alcoholic the first four years of my life. And then he found 12-step recovery. And so I kind of grew up in these meetings, knowing that there were people that actually cared and they really helped our family. And so my father actually just celebrated 40 years of sobriety. That's wonderful. Yes, yeah. And so he's our, him and I, are, we're best friends today. And we just, we help one another. He gave me a little pep talk before I came. <laughs> and I gave him a little pep talk before he was going to speak at a meeting. And so uh, we're best friends today. And that is all due to redemption, but also the restoration of relationships, yes. which I have learned through loving Jesus. Yes. And so um, also I share in my book about at seven years old, something pivotal happened in my life and my yes. friend was kidnapped and murdered. A seven year old. A seven year old. And we knew who the murderer was because he admitted to it and it was someone that we knew in, in the town, the small town wow. that I, w I lived in. And that was pivotal in my life because I actually adopted survivor guilt. So from seven years old until I got sober and clean and saved, I realized that there was this survivor guilt that kept me as a victim. And I had that victim mentality then. And then I started you know, smoking nine, cigarettes addicted, at nine. Addicted, addicted, to, addicted nicotine to nicotine at nicotine. nine. Yes. Yesterday, it's been 18 years that God has saved me from Praise that addiction. God. Praise God. Yes, yes. By the grace of God. That was the hardest addiction. The cancer <laughs> sticks. That's right. Cancer <laughs> sticks. And then um, at 14 years old, I started you know, drinking alcohol and, and just uh, had a lot of trauma. And a lot of things happened throughout my teenage years. Yeah. And now you were rebellious too, weren't you? I, I was, but I was quiet. You know, my parents always joke around. I didn't start talking until I was three and I haven't stopped oh. since. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, I had an older sister. She did a lot of talking. She was kind of my mama. She took care of me and, uh, and I'm so grateful for her and we're yeah. best friends today. Aww. And uh, so she really helped me through my life growing up and, uh, and still helps me today. Uh, she taught me how yeah. to cook and, you wow. know, take care of family and that. So I'm really grateful. Well, in college, you were bad. <laughs> <laughs> Bad. <laughs> yes. Uh, so it is by the grace of God <laughs> that I work for the government today because I should be in the state, but not working for them, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, yeah so I did a lot of illegal things and a lot of uh, dangerous things, uh, very so you, destructive. You journey. opened a lot of doors, didn't you? Oh, absolutely. I was going to ask you, did your mom and dad know? That you had early on, did they have any clue? No, I Because I know you said you went to the ER. Did yes. they know about that? Um, I think they did know about that situation where I went to the ER and I had drank and used too many drugs and then went home, had the heart monitor hooked up, was still partying. Yeah. And uh, that is, you know, that's the baffling part of addictions is that you don't even see it in front of your eyes, the destruction that it happens spiritually and emotionally. Well, you know what? We wanted you guys to hear what she had to say about all of her past, to know she knows what she's talking about, and she can truly empathize with people that are going through drug addiction, 
In fact, abuse. You yes. went through abuse too. Yes, and domestic violence oh, wow. and rape. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, the so devil tried to keep me down. Yes, he did. <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, <laughs> you were an atheist. You love Jesus with all your heart right now. But I at do. one time, what happened? I truly believe at seven years old, I thought that God killed my friend and just abandoned me. And I believe at that point, when I was raped as a teenager, I was just done. And I thought, you know, if you're supposed to protect me, you didn't do a really good job of that. And so I just kind of turned my back and made God irrelevant in my life. And then um, dabbled in just all kinds of other different religions and I was really lost. I was very, very lost. And like I said, caught up in the destruction behaviors of addiction and Ill illegal activities and, uh, and really didn't have a purpose. Yeah. Hmm. So that's kind of where that all took me. And, and it's funny, we talked about this uh, in the green room that when I go into jails and I share with the young ladies or people that uh, where I've come from and what it's like today, and they always say, why are you so happy? Your life was <laughs> crap. <laughs> and I think, well, because I have Jesus today. So I, how did you come to Jesus? So I came to Jesus through a 12-step recovery program Everyone started talking about higher power and God. And I thought, oh, if you only knew what I've been through. And I just had this really rough exterior. And I had this wall built up around me because I thought, I want to hurt other people before they hurt me. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that to me is spiritual suicide. You know, when you yeah. want to hurt another spiritual being, that's, that's not good, that's, you know. And so that was kind of my, my mentality at that point was to hurt other people. And, and I slowly started to put that wall down and I started to trust other people and I started to trust myself. And so what that led to was being able to love myself and to love other people. And then I remember um, in this 12-step recovery program, I had a sponsor and she said, I know how much you like your men, because <laughs> that was another addiction. And so <laughs> she says, I want you to write a list of all the characteristics you want in a husband. And so five pages later, <laughs> I handed it to her and she goes, that's your God, that's your higher power. And I was like, oh no, you know. And she said, read these characteristics and it was trustworthy and love and loyalty. And she said, that's God. What you wrote down there, that is God. And so I literally would carry these pieces of paper around in my pocket and I would pray to these pieces of paper. And that was my God until I understood mm -hmm. the Almighty Father, Heavenly Father. And then um, it, my big spiritual awakening was I was sitting in my um, college room because I got sober and clean at college at 23 years old. And I remember... I was just really down and out and lost. And, and I remember my CD player turning on and I was really that into reggae music. That was really music. amazing. Yes, that I was, was into so reggae God. music. Didn't even know that this reggae song, that this band had this song. And it turns on because I was like, if, if you're there, God, like you need to show yourself. Because I was really contemplating suicide. And this song comes on and it says... Um, don't worry, don't worry, God's on your side, you're healthy and wise. And I thought, okay, well, if God's going to use reggae <laughs> to touch my heart, he is good. <laughs> he is really yes, good. He is. I believe an angel turned that on. I believe it too. I truly believe that an angel used that reggae music to get to me. Yeah. And I I didn't know I was thinking about on the way here, pray for me, because I still have that CD. I rented it from the library. Aww. I rented it from the library, <laughs> and I found it the other day, and I thought, oh, <laughs> I don't even want to know what my fee is on that. <laughs> it's been 21 years. <laughs> 
But That's yeah, funny. I'm like, I think I better sit and maybe send it back to them. <laughs> well, you better listen to it. I know, yeah. A few yeah. times. That's right, yeah. Mm. So that's how I started. Wow. And the miracle of it all is, is my mom is a believer and she would have Bible studies in the basement. And I truly believe my mother's prayers is what saved my life. Mm. Praise God. Truly believe Well, that. you said there is a biblical scripture that brought you to your knees. Jeremiah 29, 11. So my friends went to a Baptist church and I was like, ooh, I don't know about that. So they invited me to a Baptist church and I walked in and the roof didn't cave in. So I was like, okay, there may be a chance here that maybe I can, you know, attend this church. And I went to a Baptist uh, membership class and um, the woman show, showed a picture of Jesus and it was a picture of Jesus and there was a door and the door knob was towards me if I was standing here and you would open the door knob to, you know, and open the door to yourself and Jesus was on the other side. One, the other side of the door, there's no door knob and there's, it doesn't open to him, you know, it opens to, and she explained to me, I have to reach out, open turn the doorknob, open the door to my heart to accept Jesus. And at that point I did, and my life just changed from wow. that point really? forward. Wow. And wow. he used Praise my testimony, God. and he still uses my testimony every sure day. I'm using I don't it. know who made that painting, but it's been around a long time. Mm -hmm. yes. And uh, I never thought about it how important it would be to someone. Yes, well, I'm very visual. So I had to visualize that and really take that action and open that door to my heart. And from then I've been a Jesus freak since. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've done a lot of study. You've had a lot of experience about addictions. Yes. Tell us, what are the big contributors to addiction? I truly believe when, other, when people are struggling with addiction, we have to stop saying, you know, why are you doing that? What, and we need to ask what happened to you. And I truly believe that the root cause of addictions is trauma. Because when I look back at my testimony through my friend's uh, murder and that survivor guilt I had, and then through my own abuse and trauma and that, and, and it was this, I, I wasn't able to share my feelings and I, I didn't have the help I needed. And so what I tried to do was numb and try to escape my, you know, escape from all that pain and that hurt. So I truly believe that the root cause of addictions is trauma. It's just unhealed trauma. Trauma. Wow. Well, you learned a lot of lessons along the way. Yes. So did that help you be a staff trainer? All those lessons, how did it help you be a speaker and a staff trainer? Absolutely. It's helped me throughout my whole life professionally and per personally, um, as well as with all of uh, the clients I've worked with, all the young people I've worked with. It helps me every day. It helps me with adults as well, co-workers. Yeah. But when I speak, it helps me understand where people are at in their life and that I have to go and I have to meet them where they're at. I don't want to assume, you know, that people are at different, you know, parts of their journey in that. And so I have to meet them exactly where they're at because that's what people did for me and that's what saved my life. Yeah. Well, you ought to know. Wow. How many people do you think you've helped? Oh, goodness. Well, my first book, actually, uh, when I wrote that book, it took me 14 years to write. Yeah, uh, the the first one, um, uh, <laughs> Let Your Lessons Become Your Blessings is my first one. Slow, slow learner. Uh, yes, <laughs> very slow. I would write on receipts and bank deposit slips and napkins and all of that, and I just put it all together. So my first book, what I do is when a person buys that book, I donate a book to a woman either in drug treatment, incarcerated, or I used to be part of a strip club ministry uh, where we'd actually go out to the strip clubs and go in and we would minister to the women that work there. And uh, so I've donated 376 of my first book 
uh, to these women uh, incarcerated in drug treatment and that's in, wonderful in the clubs yeah that's wonderful mm. wow well I never heard anybody going to a strip club <laughs> to help somebody yes yeah. lots of praying going on in those dressing oh, rooms oh I'm sure exactly. yes yeah that's wonderful wow. wow yeah it's about meeting them where they're at yeah we're going to take and a break, her. and uh, after music by Sharian. I want these phones to ring. Yes. Amen. And I want people to find the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. What What are you going to do in the next four or five minutes or so? Well, I don't know. Would you like to preach, sing? Would I, would I like guitar? to preach <laughs> after 53 years no, of it? And you say question. something like that? <laughs> that's terrible. God is not willing that any should perish, but all should be saved. And you change the will of God if you are not saved. For God wants you to be saved. He is not willing. And yesterday's gone. Tomorrow may never come. Today is the day of salvation and deliverance. And so tonight, why not make this your night? the ground 
with a cry of despair. Though great or small, he hears it all, even if a silent prayer. Beautiful, Sherry. Wow. Sherry, wow. Uh, we've got two books here. Let Your Forgiveness Become Your Freedom. Now, I was just talking to somebody today, and that is the key. Yes. The key, forgiveness. People really struggle with forgiveness of themselves and others, and of God, forgiving yeah. God. You know, there's a lot of people been married three or four times, and and it's so hard for them to forgive. Mm. But it is the, the reason for freedom. Yes. It's the only reason. I agree. That you can yeah. get freedom. Mm -hmm. And this little book you read, and tell us why this is different than this book. <laughs> <laughs> well, the first book actually has my testimony from birth to 2012. And that second book, uh, Let Your Forgiveness Become Your Freedom, Nobody wants it. <laughs> I, I joke about that because be, people will buy it kind of behind the scenes, yeah. but they, they and maybe for somebody else. Yeah, yes, <laughs> yes. And so they struggle with forgiveness, especially if, as a woman, you're struggling with addictions. And the first thing that happens is they they really struggle with forgiving themselves, especially mm. if they're a mother. And they struggle with that I placed addictions above my child's welfare. Yes. And so um, it's actually a funny book. I mean, there's some funny things in it. <laughs> and it's, you know, my writing style is short stories because right. people are busy. And I like to write that way so people can literally open it up anywhere and just start yes. reading. It's very interesting. Yes, yeah. And so then it, it's a little short story. And then it has a biblical uh, verse that goes with it some Bible scripture and then questions to kind of bring it home a little more and, yeah. and dive deeper into that lesson. Amen. Well, getting back to the book we're talking about, you know, talking about abuse and addictions, what would you say to someone who is really struggling with both abuse and addiction? I or think, maybe each one. I think uh, first and foremost that there are people that care. They're not alone. Oftentimes, you feel like you're alone. You feel like that you're the only person that's going through that. But I want people to understand that they're not alone and that there are people there to help them. There's therapy, there's counseling, there's Christian counseling, there's uh, pastors are willing to help a lot of times. Celebrate Recovery is an incredible program for people that struggle with hurts, habits, and hangups. It's in 30,000 churches throughout the world. Yeah. And so that's a great program for people to really get involved with to start that journey of healing that yeah. they need. Well, you're married. Yes. Your husband was an atheist also. Yes, an atheist Jew. <laughs> yes. So would you, you share married him met? as an atheist? I did. Crazy, right? What was I thinking? Well, God, <laughs> God spoke to you. That's just right. Love him. Just God, love him. Yes, God spoke and he kept saying, just keep loving him. And I'm like, oh, but it's so much work. <laughs> but so he came, he moved, he's from England. And so he moved from England to Ohio. That's where I was born and raised. And we got married in 2003. And when I introduced him to our pastor, and you know, I was all excited. Like, I'm gonna get married finally. Can't wait. My pastor's gonna meet my to-be husband. 
And my to be husband introduced himself. Hi, I'm Warren. I'm an atheist. I don't want to hear anything about Jesus. <laughs> and I'm like, well, that didn't go any way that I thought it was going to go. And, you know, God bless our pastor. He just stuck his hand out there and he said, I'm Pastor Roger and I love Jesus. And in our church, we worship him. You are more than welcome to join us anytime. I loved his response. Yes. And so what he did is he met my husband where he's at and he loved him. Yes. Inter invited him to church. And what's so cool is that it was a couple weeks later, I kept inviting my husband to church and he went, oh, no, I'm not going. <laughs> and then finally he came and he sat with his arms crossed the whole time, tapping his foot because it was contemporary music. And so my husband's a dancer and singer and that just hooked him right in. And within six weeks he was saved and up on the platform singing for Jesus. Wow. Wow, that is incredible. The power of prayer. Now, how was he brought up? As a Jew. Yes, yeah, his parents are still practicing Judaism. Yep, mm. Jews. And your son? Oh, he loves Jesus. Loves Jesus. So we had the whole church praying for us, uh, for our son, because we had years of infertility treatments. And then we lost the twin of our son. And uh, so we had the whole church praying for yeah. us and over us. And our son was born and loved from even the, before the day he was born. And we had him dedicated and he wanted to get baptized at, I believe it was nine years old. And he said, I want, I want Pastor Roger to baptize me. So we went back to Ohio oh, and he yeah. got baptized up there. Yep. So he's serving God today. Absolutely. Wow. He loves God. God. Well, you know, there are family and friends of uh, addic people that are addicted, that are alcoholics, they're on drugs, and some are even on the street. Mm. I knew of a situation like that. Mm -hmm. So how would you speak to and encourage family members or friends that are dealing with people, family members and relatives that are addicted? First and foremost, I think that addictions, it is a family disease. It's a family, uh, I don't even, I don't know how to really explain it. It doesn't just affect the person that is struggling with addictions. It affects the whole yes, family. It does. And a lot of times the family, they start to adopt unhealthy behaviors, just like the addicts, just like the person that's struggling with addictions. And so I think first and foremost, it's important for the whole family to get help. Even if that person struggling with addictions doesn't want help, it's still important for that family to get help, uh, to address things like enabling, to address things like tough love. You gotta set boundaries. One of the things I always share with family members, especially parents of people that are struggling with addictions is, uh, if a stranger came in and stole your wallet, would you call the police? And, and they say, well, yeah. And I said, well, when your loved one is under the influence and steals your wallet or money or pawns your TV, that's a stranger. That's not your loved one, you know, because at that point, addictions have taken over their yeah. life. Yeah. And so it's important for that person that is struggling with addictions to have consequences, but also to seek help. Yeah, Amen. that's good. There is a quote I got from your book I liked. Your children will become who you are, so be who you want them to be. So let's talk about that. Yes. Our children watch us. Our and words are very important, they? Aren't they listen, yes, yes. Our words and our actions. And if our words and our actions don't match up, our children are the first oh, to yes. point that yes, out. Yes, they are. Yes, and so I think it's so important that we be who we want our children to grow up to be. Yeah. Uh, because that, I, you know, sometimes parents are, oh, well, do as I say, not as I do. Well, what's that teaching the child, you know? So we have yeah. to be examples. We yeah. have to walk the talk. And so that's what that quote's all about. Amen. Well, we have one minute left. Would you look at the camera and talk to somebody that just feels hopeless? Absolutely. I just want you to know that you're not alone and that God is there for you. All you have to do is call out to him. He loves to hear strange voices. 
Call out to him. He loves you. He doesn't want to see you suffer. He has promises for you, and they're going to come true if you just call out to him and pray right now for God, and he will love you until you can love yourself. That is wonderful. Yeah, and it's absolutely true. Yes. After the break, we'll have more music by Sherry Ann. Hi, my name's Charlie. Have you ever tried to watch your favorite CTN show? Only to find out you already missed it. Aww. Well, I've got good news for you. Hooray! You can catch all your favorite shows on YouTube. And just by a few clicks. So, what are you waiting for? Go to YouTube CTN Online. Hey, when do I get my snack? That's more. Every project is a process. And in his working on us, God has a purpose and plan. His workmanship can be seen in the details of what Jesus has done through us. So walk in his process. Find your purpose.
I know you are enjoying the music today from Sherry Ann, our special guest. Wow, so awesome to have you with us, Sherry. Thank I, you. I'm going to brag on. I'm going to brag on her a little bit here. Uh, Sherry Ann has. You may have seen her on a number of things. She's been on TBN 100 Huntley Street. She's been with Bill and Gloria Gaither in the in the Gaither Vocal Band. She's been on the with the Gaither Homecoming Artists. She has also been on numerous national television programs. She's had her radio, radio singles out there and her music. She's also been a keynote speaker for women's and singles groups and events across the U.S. But what makes this so incredible and powerful is that Sherry Ann is singing today and doing all she does in ministry with a very serious hearing impairment that she has had from birth. And tell us the challenge you, you face with your hearing. Yeah, so thank you for having me here. So and glad you, to have you. You speak very well. Thank you. Thank <laughs> I you. can hear you very you well. You can hear me good. But there was a time when I couldn't always hear so well. Um, so I was, went off to kindergarten as just a little five-year-old, uh, like any other kid, exploring the possibilities of school, except for the fact that for me, school did not come so easy because mm -hmm. uh, they did not know my parents when they sent me off to school that I was hearing impaired. Mm -hmm. So I began to struggle greatly yeah. in school. In fact, I was actually, um, you could almost say, failing out of kindergarten. Um, so needless to say, life was pretty tough as a little yeah. hearing impaired girl until thankfully the school nurse conducted a physical mm -hmm. and determined that there was something uh, seriously wrong, that I was not just a problem child because I came from a broken, divorced home, mm -hmm. but rather I was a child with a problem. There's a very big difference. So once they determined that there was that problem, they gave me my first hearing aid and my grades improved. Mm -hmm. Then they gave me my second hearing aid and my grades shot through the roof. Mm -hmm. um, after that, I like to say they gave me seven years of speech therapy, but I still talk like I'm from Brooklyn. <laughs> So it works. Yeah. I mean, it works. <laughs> and life began to improve after that. I began to really excel and began to take off in school once they knew what the problem was. Yeah. And, and just to, to kind of streamline um, our conversation a little bit, she has so many different accomplishments. She got involved in beauty pageant contests, athletic awards, academic scholarships. But you became a, a doctor of chiropractic. Yes. So, and the amazing thing is, is that so once I began to do well, I was so used to struggling in school to make the grade and feeling less than everybody else. Once I began to be equal to and, and start to succeed, I was determined to be better than everybody else because I was so used to that feeling of less than. So I became an overachiever and achieved all of those, what you might think are wonderful things, except for the fact yeah. that the Bible says pride comes before a fall. What I didn't know that I was also achieving during that time was a whole lot of pride. Uh, I began to really build up myself and my accolades and my achievements, all to feel good about this little insecure, you know, about myself who was yeah. very insecure as a little girl. But thank God, uh, one critical time in my life um, when I did have difficulties, I started to experience difficulties in chiropractic college. I was so used to being um, a big fish in a little pond where I grew up. And then I go off to get my graduate degree and I was just a tadpole in the ocean. And I began to sink. And my whole world began to cave in on me. I struggled to make the grade. I had one serious relationship that failed. And just all of a sudden I began to, uh, like I said, sink. I could no longer swim and soar. And I got to a critical moment where I just didn't believe that I could achieve anymore. And my whole self-worth was based on what I could achieve. Yeah. So when the relationship broke and my grades fell, failed, um, I just because I was struggling in this big setting to, to make the grade, I began to become overwhelmed with that low self-esteem again. And I got to a moment and a point. I mean, I became a doctor eventually with help and tutors mm -hmm. at 24 but I wanted to end it all by 25. Because it just, no matter what I did and how many accomplishments and accolades, I had to realize it wasn't all about that because that was never enough. I needed one more scholarship, one more accolade, one more trophy, one more tiara, one more, yeah. one more. And I just came to a nervous breakdown, a perfection overdose. But it was in that moment, I just asked God, what, what is the purpose of all this? No matter what I do, I don't feel loved, I don't feel good enough. And in that very critical moment, I heard these words, I died for you so you could live for me. Mm -hmm. And that was life changing because it wasn't about me and what I could or could not do. Yeah. It's all about him and what he has done for us. Yeah. 
which was to pay the price for all of our imperfections, to pay the price for all of the areas that we never measure up in, to pay the price for our sin. And he will cleanse us and make us whole and new if we would just, like the Bible says, let the old man die yeah. and let, us raise, let him raise up in us a new person for him. Well, clearly, okay, at, at the, what was the point then? You, can, you encountered God in a supernatural way. He literally rescued you. Yes. And spared me. your life. Yes. For me. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and then you've been propelled into ministry. You do all this ministry. What point did you get called into ministry? You know, it's at that moment, actually, because I was now 25, and I remember when I realized it wasn't about me and that I didn't have to do all of these good things to get loved by God. Rather, I can do all these good things because I am loved by God. Yeah. So when I had the revelation that it wasn't about me, that he paid that price for me, okay, Lord, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry that I've made this about me. And so I said, please, take whatever I have for you. Not no longer so people can say, look at her grade, look at her this. Lord, I want them to look at you. The Bible says if we lift him up, he will draw all men unto him, not us. We'll fail people every time. I failed myself, let alone somebody else. So at that moment, I said, use me. Use my broken voice, my broken accent, my broken ears for your glory. So here now we have a hearing and speech impaired singer speaking, he, uh, speaking and singing for his glory. I, and I have to say, um, your voice isn't broken <laughs> to start with. <laughs> you. Uh, you have an amazing and just a sweet sound, and our, our viewers are going to get to hear more music from you today. You just have a really beautiful, beautiful voice. And if you were to say, and we're going to be leading into another song, yeah. but if you were going to say, your, your, and I'm, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to say one thing, and our viewers I know are sensing this. The Holy Spirit's all over you when you Thank talk. You. you have an anointing to share this, and is your message um, crafted by your life experiences? What is the message you take out and share? You know, I tell people, if God can use me, a hearing and yeah. speech impaired girl, to speak and sing, what would stop him from using you? I heard somebody say one time, it's not about your ability, it's about your availability. Yeah. In Isaiah, the Lord says, whom shall I send? Isaiah says, send me. So I said, Lord, send me. Psalm 96, one, sing unto the Lord a new song. So Lord, he's given me songs to write. He's yeah. given me this message to share, to encourage young girls that if I can do it, you can do it too. And so I want to say to allow him, move out of the way and let him have his way in that. your life for his glory. I love that. Move out of the way and let God have his way. Set this next song up for us. Mm -hmm. um, because it's got a powerful message. Very much so. God on the mountain. Tell us about God it. God on the mountain. My mom travels a lot of places with me, and she shares this story of the fact that I was a scheduled abortion. Mm -hmm. We came from a broken home, and uh, my mom didn't feel she had a, a lot of resources at the time, so she had actually scheduled to have me aborted because out of her love for this child, she didn't want to bring her, this child into the difficult environment that she mm -hmm. found herself in. So she scheduled that abortion. And, but thank God, the still small voice of God told her not to do it, and she turned the car around, and of course, I'm here today. So uh, I love to wow. say Psalm 23, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. This is God on the Mountain. Oh, awesome. Share the song with us, Sherry. Thank you. The Bible says, though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we will fear no evil, for he is with us. Life is easy when you're up on the mountain. You've got peace of mind like you've never known. But things change when you're down in the But don't lose faith, or you're never alone. For the God on the mountain is still God in the valley. When things go wrong, well, he'll make them right.
when we're up on the mountain, could talk on so easy, when life said it best, now it's down. It's time for We the People, and the more we're informed about our nation's Christian heritage, the more we'll know and love our flag and love what we do in this world. We're the leaders of this world. And are going to, um, to rob and he's going to give us we the people. There are thousands of proofs of the truth of the Christian founding of our country. Today I'm going to share one simple fact from Virginia 1776. But to make it more fun, it's going to be a trivia question with only one correct answer. Virginia's Declaration of Rights contained which of the following? A, it is the duty of all to practice folding your tri-corner hat properly. B, it is the duty of all to practice ax throwing. C, it is the duty of all to reject Christianity and keep it out of the government. Or D, it is the mutual duty of all to practice Christian forbearance, love, and charity towards each other. Of course, the answer is D, Virginia's Declaration of Rights in 1776 included Christianity in it. Not a separation, they actually included and embraced it. They said that it was the duty to practice Christian values. That is a fact. Wouldn't today's government run much more efficiently if they all considered it their duty to practice Christian forbearance, love, and charity towards each other? Our founders certainly thought so. Our We the People founding fact for today is the calling of Virginia in 1776 established their Declaration of Rights by including Christianity in the government and endorsing its values and virtues for all people. One more historical fact proving the truth of our early founders, including Christianity in the government. Thank you, Rob. Yes, thank you, Rob. I tell you, when I listen to those I get more inspired yes. to be a better, <laughs> not only Christian, but a better, um, what would you say? American. American. Patriotic. Patriotic. 
<laughs> That's what I am inspired to do. Well, I want you to know that Jesus loves you. Yes, he, he loves does. you so much. And he wants to come into your life. He wants to come in and stay there. Many people watch these programs and are backslidden, but Jesus can make it all right for you. All you have to do is say, Jesus, come into my heart. Come in to stay. That's very important. Come in to stay. And he will transform you as he has Tina and as he has Thank Bob <laughs> and Jane. He'll transform you. Do it yes. today. Today is the day of yes, salvation. And, and that's what the Bible says, doesn't it? Today is the day of salvation. Mm -hmm. And I want to remind you of these two books. Why don't we remind you of three books? One is the Bible. Read that every day. And let your lessons become your blessings. And let your forgiveness become your freedom. It's the one Tina says she can't sell, but she can give it away. Let your forgiveness become your freedom. And I want to thank you yes, so thank much. Thank you for coming, Tina. Thank, thank you for having me. Being you here. both yes. are precious God bless to me. You. God thank bless you. you. And remember on the next Good Life, we've got something good in store for you. That's right. Amen. Something important for you to tune into on the next good life. God bless you. <laughs>